everyone for being here. Thank you, Alana. Um, well, I'd love to start by introducing our guest today. To my immediate right, we have Amy Miller Marvin. Uh, she's president and CEO of the Hawaii Food Bank. Previously, she was senior vice president and COO of the Bernice Powahi Bishop Museum. She graduated magna cum laude from Harvard University with a bachelor's degree in environmental science and public policy before earning her master's degree in psychology, marine mammal behavior, and biology at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. She lives in Nu'uanu with her husband and two daughters. So thanks for joining us, Amy. And on, yes. And on my far right, I'd love to introduce you all to Katherine Perkle. She's the, an associate professor in health policy and management at the University of Hawaii. Dr. Perkle is a global health researcher and life course epidemiologist. She has done program evaluation work across the globe and is particularly interested in how early life and adolescent events can influence health outcomes later in life, especially chronic conditions such as heart disease and diabetes. She has a particular interest in food security and how it affects mothers and children across their lifespans. So thanks so much, Catherine, for being here. This is the kickoff to our uh, 12 uh, event series, The F Future of Food and Agriculture in Hawaii. And uh, as Alana mentioned, it's a joint project of Civil Beat, the Hawaii Institute of Sustainable Community Food Systems at the University of Hawaii, West Oahu, and the UH Better Tomorrow Speaker Series. Uh, funders of these initiatives uh, include W.K. Kellogg Foundation, the Hawaii Community Foundation, Ulupono Fund, Kamehameha Schools, the Stepsky Foundation, and the Frost Family Foundation. Um, and, you know, we, we won't be taking uh, uh, audience questions during this portion of our program, but if questions come up, if there are things you're curious about during this conversation, take a note, save, you know, put a, put a pen in that and, and, uh, and save it, because after this first hour, we will be having an open community discussion that uh, Mahina will be uh, facilitating tonight. You're all welcome to stay for the second hour of our program. So just jot down any questions quietly or, or just keep them in mind and we can talk about them later this evening. Um, well, let's get into it. So to start out tonight, I think we should just you know, define what we're all here to talk about, which is food security. So what is food security? Is it simply a measure of having enough money or resources to be able to feed yourself? Or is there more to it? What are the parameters of, of food security? Do you want me to start with that and then we'll cut? Okay. So I think the, what we can do is first state that there are a ton of different definitions of food security. So what I'm going to start off with is I'm going to give you the international definition, the definition that's used most um, frequently, at least on the international or the global scale. So bear with me. I'm going to read it to you because it's awfully long. So food security exists when all people at all times have physical, social, and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food to meet their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. So generally what we say is that there are four pillars of food security, availability, access, utilization, and stability over time. So I'll walk through that just a little bit. And the definition that's out there, this definition that's usually, it's from the United Nations, they talk about having um, sufficient, safe, and nutritious food. So when we say sufficient, we're talking about food that's available. What is the supply of food that's there? In the United States, oftentimes we think, oh, the food supply, that's not really so much of an issue. We have enough food. But actually, I'd really call into question that. I think recently, one of those moments in which we all realized that, oh, our food supply could really be called into question is the recent formula crisis that happened. So any of us who have young children, including myself, were absolutely terrified when the shelves were empty of formula. 
But for those who, of us who live on islands as well, we know how important fish and seafood are. And right now, we also, if you, you look into what's happening globally, we have a major overfishing crisis. And that t directly affects the availability of a very important protein source globally. So the second component or pillar of food security is access. And it's defined as physical, social, and, uh, sorry, physical, social, and economic access. And we here, again, in the US, we tend to think about economic access to food. Can we afford it? And as we go into talking about some of the definitions that are more common in the uni United States, such as those that are used by the USDA and Feeding America, the focus is really on whether or not people can afford food. But in fact, when we talk about physical and uh, social access, these are different things. So the example that I tend to give, especially when I'm teaching, is that uh, if you look at older adults, many older adults are food insecure, not because they lack money to purchase the foods, but they may have mobility disabilities that affect their ability to get to the grocery store. And then social access to foods can relate to things like your gender, your sex. They can relate to things like your sexual identification, your ethnicity. So in many parts of the world, women cannot leave the house without a male escort. So you can imagine that being a source of uh, prohibiting social access to food. That third pillar, and I know this is a little long, I promise I won't be so long-winded after this, is utilization. And utilization is amongst the most complex of the pillars to describe because it captures so many different things. So utilization could be thought of as like, do you know how to cook? Do you know how to prepare food safely? One of the examples that I give based on work I used to do in Northern Canada, I used to work with Inuit in Northern Quebec, is that the residential schooling system in Canada, which only ended in the late 1990s, tore indigenous people away from their families and from their cultures and from that continuity to the land and the way you prepare foods. Many of these people return to their homelands and do not know how to prepare their traditional foods. But you can also look at utilization going beyond that. It's not just do you know how to prepare foods. It also captures areas of safety and knowing how to, so I mentioned how to prepare things safely. But when we start to think about the pollution that's occurring in our world right now, that touches on safety. So again, if we look at fish, uh, we know that many fish species are very high in heavy metals, in particular mercury, but we're also increasingly worried about microplastics in our fish. So that directly affects our ability to eat food that we prefer and to do it safely. And then the final pillar of food security is stability over time. So we know that food security can vary over time. So many places around the world, food security is high, highest when they harvest the food. But even in places like the United States, we see incredible variation around when, for example, people receive their SNAP, their uh, monthly SNAP benefits, with food insecurity be high, being highest right before they receive those benefits. So that is the very long-winded definition of food security from an international perspective. And I am going to pass it on to Amy to sort of talk about sort of the, what it looks like here in Hawaii and more from a national perspective. Sure. So... Um, uh, at the food bank, I think we think about we think about food insecurity in a pretty simple terms. Do you have consistent access to safe and healthy food, um, and and that's really how we think about it. You know, does a family, does a household have that safe access, to, uh, consistent access to safe and healthy food? Um, and a couple other points I just want to kind of make about Hawaii in particular. You know, in blue skies. I think in general, supply hasn't been that much of an issue for us. You know, gray skies, when we think about disaster preparedness, I know we have a whole other session to talk about that in the future, but really in blue skies, supply isn't so much of an issue. Um, Food waste is a major issue, though, here in Hawaii. So if we think about how we utilize food and how, you know, how much food is going to, to people to consume versus how much food is going to the waste stream. I think that's another big issue that we think about a lot. I think last year, Hawaii wasted 237 million, no, it was 237,000 tons of food went into the waste stream, and that's almost half a billion pounds of food. And as we've done work at the food bank to really try to assess, you know, how much food should we, if we were successful to be sure that everyone that needed food got food and we closed that gap. You know, we think on this island, we'd probably need to distribute about 30 million pounds of food. So 
if you think about 500 million pounds of food going to waste every year, that's, that's a pretty big issue. Um, and then I think for us, you know, the economic piece is a big, is a big issue. It's a big part of it. It's not the supply with some exceptions, um, is, is available, but not everyone has equitable access to it. And so really thinking about how do we find the folks that don't have access to food, whether it's transportation, whether it's, whether it's financial, um, where are those pockets of people and how can we be sure we, we can find them so that we can meet their needs. Thank you. That's, you know, such an expansive definition of, of this subject tonight. I, I certainly myself thought, okay, it must have to do with being able to afford food and maybe supply. I mean, we live on an island chain. We know how vulnerable we are, but, but there is so much more to it. So thank you for explaining that. Um, now, we know that the last three years of, of economic decline have thrown many people into the throes of insecurity, some for the first time in their lives. And now we're dealing with inflation that is spiking the cost of gas, of, of uh, rent even, of, of really so many things in our lives, of food, of course. And I'm wondering, what, what is the status of, of hunger, of food insecurity uh, in Hawaii? Do we know how many people it affects? Uh, are there certain pockets that are affected more? And, and kind of how has it changed over this tumultuous time in our, in our history? I could start on that one. Um, it's a really, I think it's a really good question. It's a complicated question too, because there's all kinds of data sets. There's national data sets. There's models that predict for, for Hawaii, for, for islands. And it's something that we think about a lot, right? So like, how do we measure how many people are food insecure in our community so that we can meet their needs? Um, I think we, we all know when the pandemic hit, the food insecurity just, just really skyrocketed, um, that our service doubled the number of people that we were serving. Um, we are, and so I think I can talk mostly about what we're seeing in terms of service. And I can talk a little bit about how we try to match that up with food insecurity rates. Um, but if, you know, food insecurity rates, it's, it's a measure in time, right? So it's a point in time Feeding America just came out with their new, the 2022 study that has 2020 food insecurity rates. And so, you know, we're trying to spend a lot of time thinking about, well, what does it mean to have a snapshot in time from 2020 in terms of what we're doing today and what we're seeing today? So I'll say that in terms of what we're seeing today, um, the numbers are down from the highest point of COVID overall. I know there are pockets of the communities where, where we're seeing numbers that are equal to the height of the pandemic. Um, we also know that after the recession in 2008, it actually took 10 years for food insecurity levels to return to where they were. So it takes a lot of time. You know, people put put their groceries on credit cards, their bills pile up. You know, it takes it takes time for people to really kind of dig out of um, out of a, a real crisis like that. That even being said, you know, as of the springtime, we were still serving about 50% more people than we were prior to the pandemic. So we, we saw a big, a big increase that those numbers had started to come down. And then over the summer, like maybe May, June, July, we've really started to see those numbers start to come back up. So we think it's, I mean, it's obviously, inflation is a big part where, um, you know, our partner agencies are, are talking to folks on the ground. Um, inflation is, is really hitting everyone hard. And I think we all know it's probably hitting everybody when you go to the grocery store and you, you um, get your bill at the end. Uh, those numbers, they've gone up, and especially some categories of food, like fresh produce, milk, dairy, eggs, meats, fish, um, those healthy foods are, are even more expensive. So people are having to make, make choices too about what kinds of food, what can I feed my family? And sometimes those choices are maybe to go to something that might be less healthy, less healthy for you. Um, but we are seeing, um, people, you know, I think our, I'd anticipated maybe okay, some of the folks that are needing to ask for help now, had needed help during the pandemic and they maybe just got out of it and now they're kind of back in that same position. But 
we're actually finding that there are people that are needing us for help from the very first time. They've never had to ask for help before, but the combination of inflation um, on food prices, gas prices, you know, when you need to decide whether or not you can put gas in your car to go to work or put food on the table for your family, um, you know, that's just a position that no one should have to be in. So um, I will say, you know, so we think the numbers are going back up. It's really hard to tell. I think what one of the things we're trying to do is get a better handle on who we're serving. We work with about 200 partner agencies. So we don't do a lot of direct distribution at the food bank. Um, most of the food we distribute is through a network of partner agencies, which I think is such an amazing model, right? Because there's community groups in the community that know people that can help and support and provide services, sometimes besides food. Um, but the, to then to gather all that information together um, is really challenging. And because we have varying levels of, of um, like technological capacity with some of our agencies, to so some we get beautiful reports. And I see some of my agency folks in the audience here, we get 50 pages of faxed, handwritten sign-in sheets. And so it's just really hard for us to get really a handle on, okay, who are we serving? What are their needs? Are, you know, do people need to visit more than one place? Are we meeting their needs? These are the questions that we're really asking. So we're looking to put together um, a new data set that all of our agencies can use, actually a household level CRM, so that we can learn more about the people that we're serving and find out, do those, uh, um, are those matching up with what we think about where food insecurity is? Yeah, and I think what's really, I mean, what's important about what you're talking about is, you know, what you guys are actually seeing on the ground. Um, from a researcher perspective, there's a number of different ways in which we can measure food security. Um, and this is part of the complication here in Hawaii is that everybody's using different measures and a lot of the measures that are out there are not actually appropriate for our state. Um, so I can say in terms of changes over time, one of the things our research team did is we measured food insecurity um, using the same question. So we can, if it, you'd like to know a little bit more, there's all sorts of different ways you can measure it, but we were looking at the individual level. And so in 2018, right before the pandemic, we inserted a question into what's called the BRFIS. This is the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance Survey. This is annually done by the Centers for Disease Control. You actually have to pay to add questions so we paid $3,000 to add a question. And the specific question um, was about whether or not people had enough food in their household or whether they believed that they would get through the month with enough food in their household. And so from an academic perspective, it's considered validated. It's considered a question that works. And we stuck it in there. And when we got the results back, and this was in 2018, we were surprised. Basically, what we saw is that one in five households were food insecure. And we saw large disparities by race ethnicity. In particular, we saw high levels of food insecurity amongst Native Hawaiians, Filipinos, and other Pacific Islanders. So we had this um, survey that we'd done. And what was really unique about it is it is what we call representative of the population. So basically the people who are interviewed, proportionally they look like our own census data. So that gave us an opportunity or a baseline to see what was happening during COVID. And so in uh, July and August of 2020, we worked with a group called SMS. They're a data gathering organization. They're actually the ones that administer the BRFIS. And we inserted the exact same question into a short survey. And again, the population that they use is representative of the state of Hawaii based on census numbers. And what we saw was, again, a very similar estimate about one in five people were food insecure. And then again, we did this a year later. So what was surprising about the results was that overall, we did not see a large jump in food insecurity during the pandemic. We saw a marginal increase, but it wasn't as high as we thought it was going to be. But then when you started to break down the numbers and look at certain groups, that's where the data got kind of shocking. So I don't think it's surprising. We saw much higher levels of food insecurity on neighbor islands. 
um, where we saw some really big increases were amongst Native Hawaiians. The food insecurity amongst Native Hawaiians between 2018 and uh, 2021, it grew by 13%. We also saw that amongst working age adults, particularly those who were under 30, again, about a 12% increase from 2018 to 2021. People who were living on their own and women were also more likely to be food insecure over time. So this data was really particularly important because it was highlighting groups that need to be targeted, but it was also not surprising. The working age adults, we know that during the pandemic, the groups that were most likely to have been laid off and to lost their jobs were often these working age adults. We also know that for a variety of reasons, and I believe this is going to be come up in, a, in the next session, that Native Hawaiians, Filipinos, and other Pacific Islanders are particularly vulnerable groups because of the types of jobs that they already have. Those were predominant. A lot of the jobs that these groups hold were the ones that were first lost during the pandemic, and they were already vulnerable going into the pandemic. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of how things looked um, during the pandemic. We actually haven't done anything now, and it'd be really interesting to see with inflation. I'd also just add to, I mean, um, there's a lot of federal aid that went into the system in the beginning of the pandemic, and we know that some of these programs work, like the child tax credit. We really know that, you know, it, it makes sense if you spend money um, on and supporting people, they're more likely to be able to put food on the table for their for their families. Um, and we had a, about a, a trifold increase in USDA food commodities that was coming in. So the charitable food sector and US, the, the federal government put a lot of funds into fighting food insecurity. And I think in a lot of ways it did work because we probably would have seen much higher increases if it weren't for those programs. Um, that being said, we also know that there are people that are falling through the cracks, right? And so that th that's where I think the data becomes really, really important because if you have easy access, if you're near a food pantry, if you don't have a feel stigma around it, there's so many barriers to accessing the charitable food network or um, services that you might be that you might qualify for, like SNAP, that there are people that are that are food insecure and not getting access to services. Um, and then the last thing I just want to kind of mention too that we've been trying to think through a lot is how does the charitable food network intersect with food insecurity? Does the work that we do and the food that we provide, is that bringing people out of food insecurity or are we you know, not making it? Does someone still consider themselves food insecure even though they maybe had enough food on the table because they had access to different programs? And we think, and my understanding, the Feeding America research research team feels that at least SNAP benefits from the federal programs, those are actually bringing people out of that food insecurity measure. So someone just feels like I'm comfortable, I do have consistent access to safe and healthy food, but it's only because of these programs that's making this available and of those programs in a way. So the other thing that we're worried about right now is a lot of those federal programs have ended and will continue to end. You know, things are continuing to phase out. So, so where that leaves us in the coming year with federal commodities down. Um, although the USDA did just invest $1.5 million in, in food assistance, so I'm really interested to see where that goes and how that what that comes to Hawaii. But um, I think we are really concerned about what's going to happen over the next several months. That's really interesting, Amy, because uh, you know uh, there are many societal issues. You can throw a lot of money at it, and it's not changing anything. So, so that seems like something that was the pandemic illuminated for us. We know that throwing money at it does seem to work, right? So, yeah. There, I mean, there's a uh, study that just came out this week about child poverty over the last 30 years in the United States has dropped by 60 percent because of the different programs that we've put in place. So, I do think, you know, there's demonstrated value to the safety net. It's just, it's not enough. We're letting people fall through the cracks. So we know that uh, food insecurity and poverty are are certainly related, um, but but do they necessarily go together? Could you be middle income and be food insecure? How how does economic status, you know, play a role in this? <laughs> so 
Uh, no, they're not synonymous. So food insecurity and poverty are not the same thing. Um, we see those terms conflated a lot. Um, we see politicians assume they're the same things. We see the media assume the same things. Um, Poverty certainly contributes significantly to food insecurity, especially if you're thinking about food insecurity as being um, driven by monetary causes. So if we kind of come back to that initial definition where we said that food insecurity is actually a complex thing, it incorporates availability, physical, social, and economic access utilization concerns as well as stability over time, we can recognize that poverty is only really capturing that part that's financial access. So it's certainly a major contributor, and definitely in high-income places like the United States or Canada, poverty is the driving contributor to food insecurity, um, but it is certainly not the only thing. And to your question earlier, can you be middle income and food insecure? Absolutely, and that sort of goes back to the example I was giving earlier where um, people with disabilities may not be able to access food because they physically can't get to it. I think um, the latest ALICE report for Hawaii has 69, was it 69%, 60%, something over 50% of Hawaii households are acid limited. Hey, acid limited, <laughs> income constrained and employed. Um, and and it's, again, I think with inflation really, really hitting hard and food prices going up so dramatically, um, many people who are employed, who have been able to make ends meet, are now finding themselves unable to make ends meet. And so, you know, I'm, I'm learning from you guys that it's really complicated to, to measure food insecurity and it's fluctuating all the time and uh, there's great data. It's not always up to the minute data. Um, is there sort of like a, a neat number we can point to and say last year or, or whatever, it, last year in Hawaii, the rate of food insecurity was 7%. I mean, do, is there kind of one number to to show or it's just so fluctuating that we can't really pin, pin it down. We were yeah. talking about this earlier. I mean, you just heard Catherine say that the most, the study they did, representative 25%, what, one in 20%, 20%, 20 one, in five, one in five households yeah. was food insecure. Um, I think the number, we, we use, um, Feeding America has this uh, model called Map the Meal Gap. Um, they had projected numbers for 2021, which is one in six households or people in Hawaii and all over, we've seen other numbers that are much lower also. But again, when we think about who we're serving and knowing that there are people that we aren't reaching, um, I think that th those, higher per those higher estimates are probably more accurate. Also, because we live in the most expensive state in the country. And so many of the estimates that, especially on the low side, they're util utilizing, for instance, the supplemental, or I'm sorry, the standard poverty measure doesn't include cost of living. So you think about the cost of living in Hawaii is so much much higher people who are earning an income where you maybe could pay for adequate supplies of healthy and safe food in another state when you're here in Hawaii, it wouldn't be possible to do that. Let's talk about childhood food insecurity. Um, you know, what, what? How, how, how is a person affected when, when they go through a childhood where food insecurity is a norm? Do, you know, do we know how, how that affects them long term? Um, and, and also, you know, on this same subject, what role do schools play in this issue? So I'll speak from the public health perspective, and then I'll kind of pass on the, the school to, to Amy. But from a public health perspective, there are uh, quite a number of outcomes, health outcomes that are associated with food insecurity in children. Um, so we see that children that have experienced food insecurity are more likely to have cognitive problems. They're more likely to experience aggression, to have depression, anxiety, um, mood disorders as they get older, substance use problems. Um, in work that I've done, we were looking at a group of children, um, and what we basically did, it was a small group of indigenous children, and we looked at food insecurity status and what we call linear growth, how tall they were. 
And we saw that children who were food insecure were about, um, they were significantly shorter. I believe it was about two centimeters or half an inch shorter than their food secure peers, which is a really dramatic result. Um, it means that there's really, there's something going on physiologically that's causing this them to be shorter. And then we followed up on that when they were adolescents and saw that those children who were food insecure in childhood and then later on food insecure in adolescence continue to be shorter than their food secure peers. So, you know, really there are quite a number of, you know, of associations, at least at a public health level, that shows that food insecurity during childhood is quite bad um, and that's likely to carry over across the life course. And um, I think there's other impacts of food insecurity also beyond childhood to diabetes, obesity, heart disease. I mean, there's so many um, ways. I mean, it's truly a public health crisis and the amount of resources that we as a community are putting in on the back end to help ad address the effects of food insecurity is um, well, it's expensive. Yeah, it's immeasurable. It's, yeah. Well, it's quite expensive. So like you were just talking about children, those are the associations. But when we start to talk about adults, as you said, prediabetes, diabetes, hypertension, chronic kidney disease, asthma, lung disease, these are all associated with food insecurity. And then we start to think about what that costs our health care system. And there's really good data out there that even amongst people who have no chronic conditions, those who are food insecure cost our health system more. They're more likely to be um, placed in the emergency room, they're more likely to have inpatient hospitalizations, and they're more likely to stay longer once they're in the, the hospital. And then you get into broader issues around exactly what you're talking about. Do you want to put gas in the car, or do you want to um, purchase food? Well, the same thing for medications, right? If you're really struggling, do you buy food, or do you purchase your medication? And the logical response is to put food on the table to feed your family. But the consequence of that is that maybe you're not getting those medications that you need to treat your diabetes. And that causes a whole vicious cycle in which people get sicker, in which they need to use our health system more often. So without a doubt, food insecurity is expensive to our society and to our healthcare systems. And in terms of numbers, um, the Feeding America Map the Meal Gap data shows that 22.8% of children in Hawaii are food insecure, one in four and that's the second highest rate of child food insecurity in the country. It goes Louisiana and then Hawaii. Um, and, you know, I think that there are a lot of different reasons for that. And we talk about schools and, you know, for many kids, the only place that they can get a, a, a healthy meal might be school. Um, but we in Hawaii do not utilize some of the federal child nutrition programs that we could. So there's, um, I think we're number 50th in the, in the country for utilizing the school breakfast program. Um, there was a waiver that allowed for universal free lunch um, that ended just this summer. Some states have taken the step of paying for, you know, universal lunch. Everyone gets free lunch, no matter who you are, um, because there are children that maybe not qualify or their families don't have regular addresses. It's difficult to, to apply. So there are kids that don't have access to free lunch that really could use that. Um, summer feeding programs, after school meal programs. These are, there are a lot of programs that are available that for a variety of reasons, um, we are not tapping into as a community. So we're leaving federal dollars on the table and the result is that our kids aren't getting the meals that they could have access to. So there's a big opportunity there then to turn that around. Yes, for sure. And that's something we're looking at at the food bank. We're, um, we're looking to yeah. see if we can become an umbrella partner. We just started this, this um, trying the summer feeding program this year because I think we have the resources to partner with a lot of other providers. But we could do the paper. I mean, part of the reason is the reimbursement rates are very, very small. So, you know, for a, a regular, say, an after-school care provider who would want to tap into these dollars to go through all of the red tape to get a very small reimbursement doesn't make a lot of sense. But on a larger scale, if we're able to do that on behalf of other organizations and get the food out there to the kids, that way um, we can start every, you know, every dollar we get back in federal reimbursement, the dollar can go right back into the community. 
Um, I'd love to talk about a term that we all hear um, so much, food deserts. Uh, you, you know, I, I, I think I know what a food desert is, but I suppose I don't know what the definition is. I'm wondering if you can talk about what a food desert is and, and do we have them in Hawaii? So a food desert is a geographic area that um, where people don't have access to healthy, affordable access to healthy food, generally in low income areas. Um, there are some considered food deserts in Hawaii, uh, rural, rural low income areas, and then sometimes very hyper uh, urban spaces. I don't think it's as relevant of a... Um, definition for us in Hawaii, though, as it might be for other areas. You know, you look at a map of Alaska and, you know, all of Alaska is red as a food desert because you might live in a place where you have to drive two or three hours to get to a grocery store to buy food, right? So there's, um, and there are places in Hawaii, I mean, Molokai is an area that's probably that most at risk. Um, but I think I think affordability generally, and especially affordability of healthy food, produce, dairy, proteins, um, that's something that affects everybody. And then access, transportation. So, you know, if you don't have a car, if you don't have access to, um, you know, if you're taking the bus, it may be difficult to either get to a food distribution site or to a store. So I think there's other dimensions of food insecurity that probably are more meaningful to us when we think about how to attack it here. Okay, I want to also flip it because we've been talking so much about, you know, the, the negative side or the deficit side of like food insecurity and you talking about, the, you know, a food desert, for example, but there's a flip side to it. And I think this is something that's really important to highlight here is that there are very robust sharing networks. And so one of the ways in which we do um, preserve our food security is through those sort of sharing networks that we have within our communities. And I don't, I think that that is something that gets understated or undervalued. Um, and it's a part of the resilience that we have in this community. So I, I also wanted to say when you were talking about food deserts is that it's important to also think about what we do on the other side to maintain our food security. No, that's great. That's great. Um, you know, I remember during, you know, some of the darkest days of the pandemic going as a reporter to Aloha Stadium to one of the big emergency uh, food drives at the food bank hosted. There were many of them during that time. And it was a sight to see. I mean, it was cars for forever, it seemed, uh, bumper to bumper. And, and people were taking out the lawn chairs and, and toys for the kids. And it almost looked like tailgating, except we're all here for this much less happy reason than, than a concert, right? Um, and that's not the norm. That's not the way the food bank typically reaches people who are in need. That was a function of this surge in need, and, and uh, it was an emergency drive. Um, so I'd love if you could talk a little bit about how how does the food bank reach people? You mentioned through through partner agencies, and and why is that the best way? And and is there you know, talk going on of, of other ways to get to some of these people who, who maybe aren't able to get to you. Um, yeah, no, thank you for ask, asking that question. Because when I first came to the food bank, I didn't really understand the way that it worked at all. Um, and I think that visual of, right, the cars on the freeway is something that's burned into all of our collective memory. Um, and the truth is, no, we shouldn't ask anybody to wait in line for hours on the freeway just to get food, you know, access. I, we believe consistent access to healthy and safe food is a fundamental human right. Everyone should have that. You shouldn't have to wait in the freeway for, for hours. Um, but yes, that was a effect part, you know, in order to meet the need, a lot of people didn't know where to go. Um, but in, in the day to day, we work with a network of about 200 partner agencies 
And these range from small, you know, food pantries. It could be small church pantry. It could be larger um, programs that that do meal service. Um, all, all huge range of different kinds of partners who are working in the community across the island. Um, and one of the things I really love about that model is that people have access to get food right in their own communities. Hopefully, from people they can get, they know, they trust, and that you can start to build that relationship. So that over time, we can also find out, okay, is there, do you have a neighbor that might need support? Do you, um, would you need, how, are there other support services that could, we could provide? Um, about a third of the people that we support are on SNAP benefits. We know that there are people that are, have, are probably qualified, but aren't necessarily accessing those benefits. So we can either work directly or through our partner agencies to start to educate folks on, Hey, here are other services that are available to you. Um, so that's generally the way that, that we work today. One of the things that we have been working on is taking the food insecurity data that we do have access to at a, at a local level, zip code or census tract data, and again, kind of best estimates of where is food insecurity the highest across each island at that, at that local level. And then we're overlaying that with our distribution data so we can start to see, okay, how much food is going into each community and is it is it evenly distributed? You know, is it, we're seeing, sending the same amount of food per person in need. And of course, maybe not of course, but um, it's not it's not even. We have agencies, you know, concentrated in some areas, and then some areas are are not served as well. So we are right now starting to look at that information to say, okay, what 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 do we need to do to better serve those more underserved places? And it could be we need to support our partner agencies better. We, one of our goals right now is to say, how can we be a better partner to our agencies? Because they're the ones on the ground doing the work, distributing the food. Our job is to get them as much food as they can need. And then they work with the community to get it to directly to individuals and households. Um, so maybe we need to help provide more volunteers so they can add another distribution. Maybe we need to consider mobile pop-ups so that we can look at places like, okay, here's a community where there are, there's a food pantry, but it might only be open during the workday. And so if you work nine to five, Monday through Friday, you can't access that. So maybe we can look at it. Can we add a weekend distribution or an evening distribution? And we're right now we're piloting a partnership with DoorDash, um, which is incredible organization, they will fund door dashers to actually take food from the food bank or from pantries directly to our, our clients. Um, so we, we piloted it over the summer with our summer feeding program. Um, we're working right now to see if we can um, expand access to our senior food box program, because that's a community that uh, we know that there are people that are probably not accessing or participating in our senior food box program because they can't get to the site. They don't have transportation. Um, they might be homebound. They might take, have uh, child care responsibilities or um, care for a care for another uh, spouse or a loved one and not be able to, to get out of their house. So I think there are a lot of different ways that we can start to look to say like, okay, who's out there that isn't being served and what are the different dimensions, whether it's getting food to them or having more opportunities during the day for them to access food. You know, researchers who, who compile and analyze all this data and, and the food bank who, you know, is there to, to meet the need face to face with these people, you know, you guys do such important work um, toward addressing food insecurity. But what are some other strategies for eradicating this, you know, hunger, food insecurity in Hawaii? What can our political leaders do? What can our community leaders do? Is there something that all of us can can do to, to really make a difference? Like where what are sort of the action items that maybe we're lagging on and, and, and need to to ask our, our leaders to do or, or maybe we need to do our, ourselves? So um, that's a great question. <laughs> Something we think about all the time. And I mean, to me, I think the first thing, the most important thing is we kind of we collectively have to decide that this isn't OK. It's just not OK because we've allowed it to go on for a really long time. And so we're kind of 
we've been okay with it. And I really feel that the pandemic was, gave us this opportunity, this kind of empathy window, because so many people found themselves impacted by food insecurity for the first time. And I think prior to the pandemic, Many, especially the, the donors or people that we worked with, they felt, you know, they, they thought, it, of course, it's important, but it's for someone else, you know, not, not people like me. And all of a sudden, there's this huge disruption where, hey, it is people like me. It's like my neighbor. And it could have, you know, happened to me or it did happen to me um, or my friend. And, and we saw this huge outpouring of support that was really amazing to see um, people that that donated for the first time. People that, I mean, we could never have managed those mass distributions without all these new volunteers. We had, you know, many of our volunteers are Kapuna. Um, those are folks that are free during the, the work day that could come and support on a day-to-day -day basis. And they couldn't come in because they were so vulnerable. And instead, this whole new group of volunteers, you know, restaurant and hotel workers that had been laid off, they came and spawned volunteered and started helping the distribution. So I do feel like this, we're in this moment right now where I really feel like people's eyes have been opened and they have that opportunity to see like, this isn't okay. Let's figure out what can we do collectively to not just get back to pre-pandemic levels of food insecurity, but like what's really acceptable. And I think about, especially when you think about kids and you think about all of the impacts on children that you were mentioning, it's like, what, what number are we okay with? You know, is it one in 10? Is that going to be okay? Or one in 20, you know, and I think the number is zero. I really believe that number is zero. We've got to get to that. Um, and so, you know, I think it really is systemic change with the, with the safety net. A living wage is a really important part of that. And I will say that one thing that we've done at Hawaii Food Bank is we feel really strongly that we cannot be part of the problem. Hawaii Food Bank, we cannot be part of the problem. So over the last year, we have increased our minimum wage at the food bank from $14 an hour to $19 an hour. So we can... Because we, we want to set an example that, um, you know, it's not fair to ask people to work and not be able to just work one job and take that home um, and be able to feed your family. So I think a living wage, I think we as a community need to take more um, advantage of federal dollars that we're leaving on the table right now. Um, I think universal school breakfast and lunch. I think our 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 government organizations, you know, I think with with the pandemic for the first time, we've started to see really great support from our county governments um, and from the state to, for the first time, really. But most food banks and most food bank networks get regular support always from their states and always from their counties. So can we build a system where there's regular sustainable support for the charitable food network? And so that we can start to really be more creative, expand the role and, and, and make a big difference. I would, I absolutely strongly agree that, you know, we have to sit there and say, what is a reasonable amount of food insecurity? And I would say it's zero as well. I mean, this is something that's completely preventable. Um, I just want to clarify too, that hunger and food insecurity are not the same thing. And, and the reason I say that is because of public benefits in the United States, we have come very close to eradicating hunger. Hunger is the far extreme of food insecurity. It's where people really start to cut their calories. They start to cut the amount of food that they're consuming. And this, I'm emphasizing this, not to say that we don't have hunger. We do, but we've come very close to eradicating it. And that is because of programs that we have put in place at the state and federal level and that we believe that there are public benefits that can help alleviate this issue. As far as policies and more concrete policies, 
um, I would come back again to that those four pillars of food insecurity because your policies are going to differ according to what is causing the food insecurity. So I think what was discussed here a lot was that financial side of things of, you know, that there's all these different things we can do, living wages, better employment opportunities to address the financial side of things. But as I mentioned earlier, there's other reasons why we could also have food insecurity. So I would argue as far as um, our older adults or people with disability here in the state, we do a horrible job about assuring that we comply with ADA um, regulations. We really need to assure that we have environments that are friendly to everybody, no matter what, um, you know, no matter if they're able-bodied or not. So that would be looking at the physical side of um, food security uh, and physical access. Uh, we can start to talk about safe foods, right? The recognition that we need to be eating safe foods. And that starts to call into question issues around our environment and pollution. And so then if you're saying, well, are we eating safe foods? Is the food safe to eat? Then we need to talk about the sources of pollution around us. And I think something else that we have a tendency to do, and that's directly related to this question of pollution, is we have a, when we look at food insecurity, we tend to think about going to the grocery store and purchasing our food, or we tend to think about land-based agriculture. We have a very INA-based perspective of food security or food insecurity. And we tend to forget that a very important component of our food security are the oceans around us. And so I also think in terms of policies that are out there, we need to also be really thinking about our fishing communities. We need to be thinking about innovative ways to support fishing that is sustainable um, and to support fisher folk in our community. So those are just a couple points of views that show that, again, the policies are going to differ depending on how you're looking, the framework in which you're looking at food security. Thank you. Um, yeah, Catherine, Amy, thank you so much for being here, everybody. Let's give them a hand.